Okay. Uh, we are glad to have with us today Dimitri Stordulu. I don't think that uh, he needs any special introduction. It's the third time that he is giving a seminar to us, or the fourth. No, 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 second, I think. Uh, at least, at least, <laughs> I think the, the third must be. Once I was there, one and missed, and today is the third one. <laughs> okay, University of Massachusetts. He will be speaking about uh, recent progress in several uh, projects uh, he's uh, uh, doing research on. So, Dimitri, we are you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm here to give you a quick summary of the projects that I was involved with uh, in the past year or so. Um, I'm going to go really fast through some of these projects uh, that I carried out by my graduate students mostly. And I'm in a supporting role. And I'm going to focus on a couple of more that are my current favorites. Uh, oops, this thing is not moving. This thing is not moving. The arrow is not moving. It's back. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe the setup is going to escape out. The clearly most control code. The most clear cut of him. What is the mechanics of slide before she comes to him? I think we have a more general problem after this. Okay, we need to. Okay, what are the level? What are the Oh, up and down? Uh, all right, okay. You're right. Okay, yes. okay, so um, in these projects, you can see here a list of my collaborators. Of course, you know very well uh, Limus Kazanas and uh, Ioannis Kondopoulos. Uh, you have him here now, you're lucky. He left us a few years ago. Uh, Silas Lekuk is my collaborator at UML. And there is a lot of work that is currently done with uh, our collaborator, Brian Abinder in California. and. Uh, so on and so forth. Andre Nicolas Sen is the luckiest of my collaborators. He gets to live in Hawaii and work there. Uh, and in the last row, you see our graduate students that are doing a lot of work lately, highly successful work. Uh, the projects that I would like to sort of touch upon, uh, something about uh, the very famous Skymas actually binary IC10X1, the brightest X-ray source in the nearby local group galaxy IC10. Then I'm going to talk about gravitational lensing within our galaxy, the, the lensing that they call it now self-lensing, and how artificial intelligence will never be able to get it right. Never. We're ready to, to bet money on that. Uh, a, new, a new technique to analyze X-ray observations using a Kalman filter. This comes from Australia. Andrew Melatos, some of you may know him, uh, and his postdoctoral, Joe O'Leary, have done some wonderful work that uh, is bound to upset the status quo in X-ray data reduction and analysis. Uh, and then my favorite projects are the last two. They touch uh, not only in cosmology and astrophysics and uh, all that, they touch on several other themes. And one of them is, of course, elementary particles. You can't get away from elementary particles these days when you do cosmology. And uh, well, this is uh, the small Magellanic cloud. And uh, this is the work of one of our graduate students, 
uh, he took all the observations of the past uh, 20 plus years, different telescopes, and most of the sources are transient. You can see the two luminous, very luminous uh, white dots. This is uh, SMCX1, SMCX2. They are permanent X-ray sources and extremely bright, but just about everything else that you see now, they're just uh, transient. They come on and then they die out. They go into quiescence. Some of them, you never see them again. Some of them, you see them after years and all that. And uh, as we move on in time, we have the new telescopes. Uh, Chandra came online now, and XMM Newton is coming up, and uh, uh, Suzaku observations have been incorporated in our database. And uh, finally, of course, New Star, the latest observations. Uh, uh, for transient sources, the ones that show up at least uh, on a regular basis, and then they die out. This is a very basic model. You have uh, a companion star uh, on a compact star on a tilted orbit, and you have an excretion disk from the main star out to the center. And this thing, as it goes into a tilted elliptical orbit, it crosses the excretion disk twice on the way down and then on the way out. And this is where it gets a lot of material to be accreted, and you get a lot of X rays, and then when it comes out, um, you don't get anything for a while, and then the whole process repeats. Uh, dies out, pink is x-rays as it goes through the disk. I think you got the idea. Uh, so uh, we're looking at this uh, binary system, IC10X1, for many years now. In, uh, we thought uh, that there was a determination that this system is a black hole. In 2015, uh, we destroyed this notion because we showed that uh, the X-ray eclipse and the radial velocity curve are not in phase. There is a quarter phase difference, which means that uh, the, the, the emission lines that you get from the central star do not trace the X-rays. So they don't come from the star, they come from somewhere else. Uh, this is how IC10, X, uh, IC10 looks in X-rays. Everything you see in this diagram is X-rays, and you can see this big, big uh, uh, white yellowish dot. This is I, IC10 X1, uh, an extremely bright source. Uh, it's in the local neighborhood, uh, local group. 660 kiloparsecs away only, very young population. There is a big formation of wolf riot stars. The central star the, is a wolf riot star. And of course, as I said, people uh, believe that there is a huge, massive black hole, like 34 solar masses, which of course we obliterated in 2015 because uh, um, our models, unfortunately, it uh, did go down a little bit. Uh, could be a black hole of like 23 solar masses, but this, our solutions allow even for a neutral star, uh, two solar masses. I'm not saying the, the, the compact object in IC10 is a neutral star. I'm just saying that there are viable solutions based on the data right now. This is what IC10 looks in the optical. Uh, you can see a lot of dust here with those colors. And of course, a lot of stars over there. It's a highly regular galaxy. With the recent episodes of star formation, there is a lot of star formation going on there. And this is an artist's conception. I don't know if he's gonna play. This is an artist's conception of what happens in those binary systems. Why the, okay. You have a um, huge star, could be a wolf right star, as I said, it could be an O or B star. And there is material and it all overflows the raw slope, and there is material that is coming out and then goes down to the compact object. The compact object has an accretion disk, strikes the accretion disk, and remains there in the neighborhood. This is a very good artistic picture, and it's physically is completely wrong. Let me tell you what uh, the artist missed. When, when the big star overflows the raw slope, uh, the the, the Lagrange point right there at the rust lobe acts as a nozzle. So it spits out gases everywhere into the rust lobe of the other star. 
So there is a lot of commotion that is going on, a lot of dynamics. The mainstream that is coming out is fluttering like a hose. If you have a hose in your garden, you just let it go from your hands, the hose is going to flutter all over the place. That's what the stream is doing and certainly misses the black hole and the accretion stream. It goes all the way in the back where there is a stagnation point. This is proven. There, the material will stagnate and it is from that stagnation point that it will return and it will be attracted now by the black hole and the accretion disk and come and strike the accretion disk from behind, not like what you saw here. So we've done X-ray work for many years now. Recently, we're doing a helium-2 emission line. We took all the spectra from Hawaii that they didn't want to use because they were very poor quality. The problem is that the night sky is very bright in uh, those wavelengths. And um, you can barely see the helium-2-4686 line. So we grabbed all the spectra, about 52 of them, and we started stacking the spectra, adding uh, spectra uh, according to phase in an effort to give more counts into the emission line so we can see it above the noise. So we did that and then uh, I, I invented a new technique uh, to analyze this data because it's still a very small line above the background. And so I created a new technique to be able to isolate the line from the background and then uh, they was told me that uh, this technique might be usable in the case of HGN emission lines that have the same problem. They don't know where the background is and the lines are weak. So anyway, so I analyzed uh, that and... Uh, ooh, why is this so early? Uh, oh, here is the X-rays. You can see a lower bottom uh, left. This is uh, uh, X-ray uh, counts versus phase. And you can see that at phase 0 0.5, this is where we put the eclipse arbitrarily. And then it does it again. The diagram shows you two phases. And the radial velocity is not keeping up. I think uh, I'm missing slides. What's wrong with it? Sorry about that. I think we opened the wrong. Uh, can we? Can we? I think we opened the wrong PowerPoint. Can we get rid of that? And... That's why the slides are out of order. See. See. AOA. Yes. APPT. A. The regular APPT. Mm -hmm. And we open summer. This one? Yes. Okay. Slide show. Mm -hmm. From beginning. Yes. And then... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, here is the red velocity curve in red versus phase. I'm showing only one phase here, not two that you saw in the X ray uh, uh, data. Here, traditionally, we show two phases. So, you see the eclipse at phase 0 0.5, we always put it there, and at 1.5. And if you look at the radial velocity, at phase 0 0.5, the radial velocity is not zero. It is negative 400 kilometers per second. But this is the eclipse phase where, uh, you know, the black hole has gone behind the star. So the star is also crossing in front of us, in front of our uh, line of sight. Its radial velocity is being zero. But it's not. It's actually you know, maximum, absolute maximum. Uh, so something is wrong uh, with this picture. The line is also skewed. The helium line is uh, visibly skewed. We could see that in our poor data, very poor quality data. We could see the line being skewed. And uh, I also plotted here skewness 
to show you that the Spirit is also having some kind of periodicity, you will see what uh, we did with Skunis. Yeah. Uh, this is the technique that I was telling you that I, uh, I did four separate fits. It's a progression of fitting and fitting and fitting again until you clean out all the noise and you're left with something that uh, reasonably represents the line. Uh, what is missing in the beginning is the first experiential fit on the left. It's trying to figure out where the line is going. The helium line is the data in blue. So it's trying to, to determine the level where it goes, 984 or something. And then uh, we look at the background, nearby background, and the difference between the line contribution and the background contribution will tell you really how much uh, noise or jitter the background contributes. Yes. Could you please tell us how you get rid of the noise? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. For, for many things, for the same yes, time. I, I, we, we fit the line, the left side, because the background rises on the right, because there are nearby hydrogen lines. So we fit it on the left with an exponential function, the decay exponential function. And as you can see here, this one is going like to 984. And at the same time, we know from the background nearby, outside the line, what the total number of counts is in the jitter. You can uh, Anyway, if you subtract the two, you take out effectively the tails of the line. And what you're left is with pure sky jittering. Which, of course, then we keep it in the next frame. We say that uh, eventually the line, eventually the line will have to merge into that small background. That's the second frame. And we shift uh, horizontally and vertically. And uh, then we, we, this is not a Gaussian, actually two half Gaussians. We never process the data in one set because there is skewness and we don't want to lose it. They are not Gaussians, but we do the left and the right separately and they're still not Gaussians because the areas under the half curves are not equal to one half. So in the final frame, we renormalize those half plots so that the area under each half plot is one half. And you can see the final outcome and you can see how pronounced the skewness is on the right for this line. Calculating moments is not the problem. The discontinuity is not the problem because as you know, in order to calculate moments, we are sweeping. We're carrying out an integration from left to right. So it will be very easy to cross uh, through the discontinuity. And uh, the next thing I hear now, I have to deal with skewness. I have a line that is not Gaussian, it is visibly skewed. So the next idea is that this line is a composite of two Gaussians. In other words, there are two sources of emission uh, in that system. One of them we knew since uh, 2015, it must be the wind. It must be the wind of the WR star that's coming out, especially the sector that is opposite to the black hole. The idea is there. This is a relatively cool area because acceleration of the black hole cannot fully ionize it. So it's a good place for a helium-2 line to emerge. But the skewness now in the line is telling us that there is another component that may or may not be in the wind. So you see now in the decomposition, now this is analytic decomposition of the signal that you saw before into two Gaussian components and you can see it dance the purple component pulls very close to the wind. I have identified the wind. I haven't identified the purple component yet. Then uh, it's like tango or some variant of tango. Then the purple component jumps on the left of the wind. And then they both move into uh, blue shifted area. And then they come out. And then uh, of course, maybe the wind is now pivoting around the component and they go back to phase zero and they repeat all over again. It's a beautiful dance. Uh, the next thing to identify is the, the second component. And um, Brianna Binder did it for us in another system, N300X1. They call it a twin of IC10X1. They have so many similarities, but they're not twins. I can tell you for a fact. Uh, but anyway, she identified that there is a second source of emission that is coming from uh, somewhere in the area of the outer accretiveness. So 
we, we assumed that the best place to look for a second component, a meeting component, is the outer accretion disk in the place where the string comes back and hits it. Here's the outer accretion disk. So it creates a hotspot. So we think it's a hotspot that is creating the second emission. Oops. And that's our final uh, model. Many, many hours of work. This is not a cartoon. It is an exact model of what is happening, all the motions and the velocities and all that. Uh, what you see is four phases. We tried for zero, zero, about 25 and so on. But because of the stacking of the spectra, we couldn't get the values exactly right. And uh, you can see the wind at 0.5 is eclipsed. As I said, the black hole is behind the star. And you have the wind is coming toward us at full speed. But also the hotspot in the outer accretion disk is coming at full speed. And it's much faster. The velocity of the hotspot is much faster than the velocity of the wind. And as you keep going around, this is the only place where we saw blue shifted components, strong blue shifted components. In all the other frames, we are seeing redshift. To describe uh, the location of the hotspot, uh, describe the location of the binary or the black hole is easy. You got this phase number that goes by quarters. But to describe the hotspot is not so easy. So I kind of came up with a clock. I attached the clock, a regular 12 hour clock onto the black hole. It doesn't move, it doesn't rotate. It stays frozen in space. And I described the location of the hotspot. I know I'm not sure you can see it very well, but uh, by using uh, clock hours. Uh, so the idea is uh, that um, we had to assume that uh, the hotspot at phase 0 0.5 is starting at nine o'clock. It does have to be true, exactly, but we have no better way of doing that. So this huge blue shift, we assume it's a vector that is coming toward us completely. And in the case of all the other components, we, we decomposed them. We, we, we took the same component and we projected it to our line of sight. And that's how we find the location of where those things are. And uh, you can see it's a, it's a very detailed diagram. You can see the redshifts and the blue shifts in the middle squares. Um, the, the lengths of the vectors are consistent. The next problem that we have to deal with is what is happening? We have two different motions going on. You got the black hole going around the WR star, and you got the hotspot going around the accretion around the black hole. And these two don't have to be one-to-one. Uh, uh, -one. So, but they could be. The point is that for every quarter of the phase, there is a roughly a quarter of its own phase that the hotspot moves. So if they do it in unison, one quarter for one quarter, each of them will complete the full orbit after uh, phase one, at phase one. But that's not the case. Uh, there are many other possibilities. For example, the periodicity could be five to one. Wow. Five to one. Meaning that in a quarter of a phase for the black hole, the little hotspot is going to run in a full circle and then advance to the next location. So that would be five quarters instead of doing only one quarter. And it could be nine over one, meaning now that the little hotspot is going to run two full orbits around the black hole and then one extra quarter just to stay in touch. Many, many solutions, available solutions. So we rejected the one-to-one -one periodicity on the basis of uh, the, uh, the distance of the hotspot from uh, the accretion disk. It's way too big, way too big. It gets into the rest of the of the WR side. So one-to-one -one periodicity, in which case the uh, hotspot would be going the slowest, is rejected based on uh, uh, very big distance. And then we started looking at the rest of them, and we rejected all of them except five to one. We were lucky because uh, we found a way to reject all of them. The orbit of the hotspot 
is not precisely circular, it's like very mildly elliptical. We can, of course, analyze all that from the velocity vectors. It's a very, very mild ellipse. And that's why you can see here that I tried, at least I tried. Uh, there are those axes, if you can see them, also frozen like the clock. This is the major axis and this is the minor axis of the small elliptical orbit of the hotspot. It's uh, 21 degrees off of 12 o'clock, the major axis. So as soon as we went to nine to one periodicity, as soon as we made the hotspot go like really fast, uh, the, uh, the eccentricity, uh, I mean, the, the ellipse went the other way around. The major axis became minor and vice versa, which is not acceptable. So somehow after all of this, a lot of analysis, a lot of work, we came up uh, with a unique solution. Uh, this is a project that Sayant and Bhattacharya is doing at UMass Lowell with a lot of help from everybody else. We also did uh, some preliminary work on Brianna Binder's X-ray source. And uh, we found different results, which makes me feel good because I don't want to see this whole procedure producing the same result over and over again. So we got something uh, obviously different. Can you Yes. So what is the physical origin of this hot spot? How far oh, is, I said how far is it from the black hole? Oh, it's uh, in the outer accretion disk. It's actually like a ring because there is material that is coming from stagnation hitting the disk. Oh yes, yes, hitting the disk. Yes, and, and slowly it will create even a ring there because there is material that keeps coming in and the rotation pulls it. But the material is kind of diffuse. I don't expect to see. Uh, uh, a lot of emission from that material. The hotspot is like, yeah, it's because of hitting, I think, or we think. I skipped the topic of gravitational lensing. I'll tell you if I have uh, later. Uh, I, I, I can just advertise it to tell you that uh, one other student of ours, Nick Sorabella, tried uh, to be the first person on the planet who was going to discover a black hole crossing in front of a star in a binary in the galaxy. So far, we have known of only five uh, self lensing events in the galaxy. They all came out of the Kepler data, the Kepler Space Telescope, and they're all white dwarfs. How could it not be white dwarfs? I mean, there are so many more white dwarfs in the galaxy than neutron stars and black holes. But anyway, Nick was ambitious. He wanted to find a black hole. So he found the pulse, finally after a lot of uh, searching. But uh, although it looked suspect, it was a good pulse. It looked suspect because it was a Gauss and didn't have a flat top, none of this. It was a very pointy thing, which made it suspect because we had never seen things like that before. So he kept looking, he modeled it. He modeled it with self lensing and all that. And he found the black hole orbiting like 10.5 solar masses. And he started celebrating, I got it, I got it, I found it. But, but something was off, so we kept talking about it and we kept looking. And finally, Nick was guided to look at uh, the aperture images of the Kepler telescope. And he found an asteroid crossing in front of the star. The star is single, the sort of binary. And since then, and once he got the idea, once he had the proof, he, he found another four. So right now we've got five white dwarfs in binaries doing self lensing and five different asteroids for which we know the orbits and everything, crossing in front of like G and M stars, uh, producing fake signals. And we try to communicate this result right away because it's going to mess up all kinds of artificial intelligence codes. They will not be able to tell if the signal is an asteroid or real. So yeah, we'll see, we'll see what, uh, we just created another big problem for artificial intelligence in addition to driving a car and all that. Uh, okay, so I, I was preparing those slides to get into particles and stuff and, and subatomic physics. And I didn't quite remember what I had read. I read many books to get into this field. I was clueless a year ago. So I was reading many books and I, I remember distinctly that one book was saying that uh, the standard model of particle physics has 19 free parameters. 
And another one said 17, and I didn't remember, which is right. And uh, I didn't want to go back and find, trace those uh, statements in those books. Uh, so I asked uh, Chad GPT to help me out. Act one, as you can see, how many different parameters in the standard model? Comes back, it says 19. 19 is correct, except its idea of counting is very skewed, like the theory of nine. Oh, not here, you see, you see it later, hold on. That's fine. It counts you know, 19 of them, gives them by name, and of course, it tells you the obligatory thing that the standard model does not provide explanations for these parameters. You have to wait for experiment to provide them to you, and then you have the standard model in working order. So I asked ChatGPT the same question again. It gave me more or less the same answer, except that it regrouped the parameters. And then I had probably the best idea. It is next to us for a third time. And here's what happened. Apologizes to me for giving me the wrong information before. So the parameters is not 19, it's 19 plus one, because what's missing is the cosmological constant, which the standard model cannot determine. As you can imagine, the answer is completely wrong. I don't know why this thing found this information online, because the logical constant has nothing to do with the standard model. So, including is crazy. Plus, plus, look, uh, look at the counting. I mean, something went very wrong the third time I asked the question. One, you cover company for six quarts. This is six parameters. It's not one. Anyway, at least I enjoyed it, and I found out that uh, 19, 17 didn't show up. So, nineteen is the number of free parameters. The reason I was preparing a slide about the 90 free parameters is that they are no longer free. I can determine uh, virtually all of them or close to all of them uh, from theory. It, it's an empirical theory, but who cares? It works. Uh, let me give you some information peripheral to this issue. In atomic physics, there are three red yi. When I saw this, I was blown away. I knew about the red yi. Reading different pieces of physics, when you study physics, you learn about this and that and the other one eventually. But I've never seen them all together. Then I read that in the atomic system of units, they decided to choose the Bohr radius that you can see here, without any explanation whatsoever. And uh, I talked with him, and he kind, he kind of agreed with me that that was not a good choice because um, from experience, in the last, I don't know, 50 years or something, the Compton radius seemed to play a huge role in physics. But anyway, we're not gonna argue uh, in this way. Uh, the Bohr radius was chosen because it doesn't contain the speed of light. And then I found out that in the country, atomic system of units, the speed of light is not a unit. This is crazy. To go out there and create any kind of system of units that doesn't have the speed of light, to me, is crazy. What you're doing is you're turning your back to the vacuum. And you say, you don't matter. You don't matter. The restrictions that you put in the physical world, I will not take into account. And when the time comes and I need the speed, I will calculate my own speed. I will not use yours. And as you can see, the speed in the atomic system is uh, alpha, see? Where alpha is 1 over 137. This is a number that... Uh, Many people lived and died trying to figure out its meaning. And Feynman said, uh, every physicist has to put it up on the wall of their office to remind them our inability to explain this and that and the other one. Feynman was lucky. If I were living there, if I was in full research speed, I would have solved it in less than a week. Uh, because that's how much it took me here to resolve it. Uh, 137 is a meaningless number. Uh, I, I'll show you the truth. Uh, it, it was created. Uh, don't laugh. I'm, I mean, I know it's laughable, but it's also indisputable. 
Uh, the wrong phi structure constant was put together because they used Dirac's H bar, which is unacceptable. They should never have accepted Dirac's H bar in physics. It has created all kinds of errors in the calculations. You would not believe. So if you stick with Planck, who knew what he was talking about, uh, but Planck was not around anymore when Dirac came about. No one to go against the great Dirac. And uh, now all these definitions about the coupling constants are wrong because they use H bar. What's the problem with H bar? H bar is uh, contains a two pi. Two pi signifies geometry. H bar is a composite constant. It contains a physical part, Planck's H, and it contains a two dimensional geometric verb whose units are radians. And you have the System International Committee coming around, removing the radian as a unit from the system, from the international system, makes it even really worse. Now, you don't even have to write it down. So you don't see the damage that the two pi does. By the same token, when you write down Coulomb's law, the electric field comes as e squared over four pi. Ah, whatever. The four pi signifies three-dimensional geometry. Apparently, the little charge E that sort of exists in a three-dimensional world does not know it, apparently. So the force law teaches it that it lives in a three-dimensional world. The two pi in H was created like in simple planetary planet models of quantized uh, uh, orbits in atoms. This is 2D, a laughable 2D model. Uh, and, uh, has nothing to do with modern quantum ideas. And now it has propagated, perpetrated everywhere in physics. Uh, too bad, too bad. I wasn't there either. Uh, here is the fine structure constant without its bar. Uh, you can see what's going to happen if you write h over 2 pi. The 2 pi of the racks will eliminate the 4 pi three-dimensional geometry, and the constant will contain no geometry. It will contain only a loose factor. So now you say to the electric field, I don't care what you know. I don't want to see what you carry with you. I only need your ease. This is uh, not acceptable. This is the gravitational coupling constant. There is an H here, and there is no geometry as it should not be. This is gravity we're talking about. And we normalize it to two physical quantities, H and C. If you put the two pi, you're introducing two dimensional geometry into the gravitational constant, which they did. And of course, it's not right. <coughs> if you use H, the 137, the famous 137 becomes H61. And H61 is not the prime number. It is 21 by 41. And its component uh, factors uh, play a role too. You can play that game with 137. 30, 137 is prime. So, 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 yeah. So, the true fine structure constant of H bar there? Yes, uh, both of them. So, this is your definition? Yes. Yes. Soon it will be everybody's definition. <laughs> uh, so it got me thinking about systems of units and what contributes what to system of units. Uh, it went completely on the tangent line, this whole project. So here is what I think. Forget all those systems of units that people have created. They have all kinds of weak, 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 weaknesses. Let's, let's just think from the beginning. The first thing you need to do in a system of units is you need to include the constants that the vacuum dictates and provides. The vacuum is not a force in this universe. It is a passive entity or whatever medium, which however affects the physical world by imposing limits. And it imposes two of them. One of them is the speed of light that you all know. And the other one is the impendence of free space. So you have to include both of them. Then you have to include, yes. The impedance of free space is the speed of light. No, it's not. Because the speed of light is the geometric mean 
of one over mu times one over a. That's a geometric mean, by the way. Uh, if this is a mu naught over a naught square root, one of them gets reversed. The mu naught. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Did I tell you that all the fundamental equations of physics are geometric means? All of them. Like those two. There is a reason for that, too. So, uh, no, they're not the same. You have to put them both in. Then, of course, you put the uh, constants, physical constants, like Planck's constant. Uh, uh, they, they also, G, Newtonian G, the constants that describe forces. And in the end, you must include also dimensionless constants. This is where the fun began. I started reading desperately, trying to figure out how I should treat a dimensionless constants in out of unicellular systems of unicellular that. And I found nothing in the literature. I found uh, cliches like if there is a dimensionless constant somewhere in physics, well, this must be important. It points to an important effect. Well, we may not know what it is, but there is some kind of importance hiding in the background. This is all gibberish. It tells me nothing. So I had to, to, to figure out for myself how to use uh, the fine structure constant, uh, gravitational coupling constant. People know, as far as gravitational coupling is concerned, they threw it away. This is 10 to the minus 44. This is 0 0.007. So they threw this away. Ah, you don't play in the atomic world. I'd throw you away. I'd throw nothing away in my thinking. So how do you use this thing? We must use dimensionless constants the only way that we know how to use any number and any constant. In all systems of units, believe it or not, we include number one. We must include number one. Otherwise, number two is meaningless. I need number one to be able to compare number two and say it's twice as big. And then three and four and all that. We need a basis for comparison. Same for dimensionless constants. So what I thought is that obviously the fine structure constant will be a basis for comparisons because it can be measured. It's been measured. We know it to eight decimal places now. Eight decimal places. So this is going to come as this. That will be our number one dimensionless constant. And uh, all the others have to come in in ratios. Because by themselves, like this one, they tell me it's very weak. It's very weak. Oh, yeah? How do you know that? Well, they compare it to that. But then they don't play with the comparison. They just eliminate it. So I think that uh, you should uh, include the ratios of all the other constants. Here is the ratio. Now you begin to see the physics behind the wall of this. Here is the ratio, I call it beta g. It is the gravitational coupling of a fine structure, no edge bars here. Oh, no, I mean it. I mean, even if you put edge bar, the edge bar are gonna dance in here. So, Beautiful, beautiful ratio. Eliminates the edge bar, sets us back on the straight row. That's what it is. Only the e square has the four pi, three dimensional geometry, and it's really the ratio of gravitational to electric energy. It's a small number. I agree. But it's the number that gave me a reason to continue because I managed to prove this coming from a completely different direction. What you heard is the conclusion, not the investigation, the steps of the investigation. Uh, if you take the Planck mass and you multiply it by a square root of p, you get a new atomic mass. It's 15 MeV, which I found not by calculating this. This equation, I checked it later, after I had the 15 MeV in my hand. How I got it, you can read the paper and you will know. That's how it works. What do you mean? Because I need, for the Planck mass, I need the square root of HC over G. So at some point, I have to take the square root. I mean, the, it's a dimensionless thing, so. It works out, you see the paper. And here is my own fine structure constant. It is uh, one over A, alpha is uh, 861, it's 21 over 41. 
and there are all kinds of applications that take me all over the place. And in the middle of all this situation, the developing situation in the atomic world, I also discovered like two, two instances of the tiny fissure relation in subatomic physics. This is another blowout. Those who know what the tiny fissure relation is, it is discovered in spiral galaxies and then the favorite Jackson relation in elliptical galaxies. It simply says that some sort of velocity, characteristic velocity of the system, goes like mass to the form. This is what uh, all modern theories who insist to rely on Newtonian theory or general relativity fail miserably. They cannot explain uh, the telephysical relation. I'm willing to go out and tell them in their faces that relativity is failing in the test of the telephysical relation. The first one who got it right was Milgram with modified dynamics. In modified, modified dynamics was designed and we have a new theory about the variation of G in space that does pretty much the same thing. Anyway, many, many applications. Once you, you understand really how to work with all those quantities, what the vacuum provides, what the forces provide, and all that. Uh, this other, the weak coupling constant, square root of that, it's about 129 point something. Extremely important. It played a huge role in my thinking. Little did I know about this. When I tried to relate the mass of the Higgs and its vacuum expectation value, its bad, to the masses of all the other uh, quarks, I could. I did that by using geometric means. Everything is related with everything by geometric means. I wrote maybe. 15 different geometric mean relations, and then I stop because I got time. I could have written another 15. Everything is a geometric mean uh, in those fundamental relations. But I couldn't get the bottom quark to participate. The, it participates in some geometric means, but I couldn't relate it to the Higgs particle. And then it occurred to me that it wasn't formed by the same mechanisms that all the others were formed. It was formed by a clear deflation. Um, if you divide the two masses, Higgs over bottom, you get uh, 30. So something strange is going on between the Higgs and the bottom. Nothing strange uh, in all the other particles. Um, and eventually I proved also Coitus constant and some other constants and all that. These are weird topics in atomic physics. How can I, and finally, in the process, I calculated all the masses of all the quarks and leptons and this and that uh, from the three only parameters. So how can I open the PDF file? How can I? I want to show you the mass ladder. It's, I couldn't copy and paste it. Um, the, what I call the mass number is the masses of all the protons uh, and uh, uh, the leptons and the quarks, and they're all based on three numbers only. You got to give me the mass of the case. I cannot derive it from the first principles. And then you got to give me two scaling constants. One of them is called this constant, which is two thirds. And the other one is this one over 30 with coupling constant. And once you do that, you get just about everything else. We start with uh, the children of the Higgs, the vector bosons. You get them by simple scaling with a coitus constant. We move on to the quarks. Uh, focus on the bottom. All the other formulas are empirical, of course, they're totally empirical, but they come from geometric means, by combining geometric means, not this one. The mass of the bottom is the mass of the Higgs divided by 30. It's the deflation scale that I told you. No way to get it through geometric means. And then it gets more complicated. As you go to the small, 
quarks. And then we got the electron and the muon and the tau. These are the leptons. And I threw in uh, the ice on the cake. I also calculated the proton because I could, not because I needed. And uh, on the left uh, second column here, you see the actual experimental values, the ones that are measured. And if you use these formulas, you see here the deviations. Don't tell me that uh, my error bars are too big. In quantum crude dynamics, if they get something to within 20%, they declare a victory and celebrate it. The Casimir effect is approximated by a factor of two, and they celebrate it. They get it. I can do a lot better, as you can see. Tiny little percentages. So how can we remove that now? Oh, I see, I, I think I can. Oh, this thing interferes. Yeah, okay. So, so All right, I got it. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't originally going to do anything with the mass lab. The referee pushed me, pushed me uh, badly. Uh, what are you going to do with all these geometric means? They're all empirical. Yeah, they're empirical, but I have the right to write it down. So what if they're empirical? So anyway, he asked for applications, and he pushed me. He pushed me real hard, and then I calculated everything. Uh, I'm not going to show you the numbers, but I go in with those things, with the mass ladder and the scalix, the k and the 1 over 30, and I can calculate all the Yokawa couplings. I can calculate the y per angle. I can calculate just about everything. They consider a free parameter, and they wait for the experiment to give it to them. I've got them all, and I've got them real close. It's not like I'm sitting at a 40% difference or 20% difference. So there is no doubt that my empirical relations work. Now, why they work, I don't quite know. All I know is that they're geometric means. They're based on this idea that everything in nature obeys geometric means. Why would, would nature do that? Anyway. Uh, how much time do you have? A few more minutes? I want to tell you about my latest. In the middle of all this going on, Timos Kazanas is talking to me on the phone, and I don't know how the conversation went that way. And Timos says, uh, you know that one of the biggest mysteries in atomic physics is why the neutron is 1.3 MeV more massive than the proton. I said, yeah, I know that, uh, but I don't know. I didn't know that it's considered a big mystery. He says, well, yeah. I said, people say it's an electromagnetic type of effect. Something with electromagnetic force over there creates like a small difference in the masses. Uh, he says, yeah, yeah, that's what they say, but it's all hand waving and nobody has actually demonstrated anything. They said that. I said, you're kidding me. You're just giving me a problem that I can solve in less than a day. Less than a day. And you're telling me that it's considered fundamental. I cannot be. It cannot be. I solved it in a few hours. Here's the solution. The configuration, those neutrons and protons and other particles are big energy conglomerates. They're effectively all of them energy. All of them. There is a, what's called the quark gluon C. It's a sea of quarks and gluons, like an unimaginable number of quarks. And then in this whole shuffle, three of them emerge to give like the basic characteristic to the particle. And they call them the virus quarks because they're supposed to, I don't know, to orbit on the, on the outer region of the quark. So the problem has a structure here, you need, these are the smallest ones, little ones. The neutron is UDD. U is 2.16 MeV, and D is 4.67 measured. So as soon as he gave me the problem of the 1.3, I go on a piece of paper and I subtract the quarks. I subtract the mass of the quarks. It is meaningless to try to compare the mass of the neutron and the mass of the proton since they don't have the same quark structure. So I take it out. People do that routinely, and the result the remaining energy, mass energy, that you obtain, they call it by many different names, which I didn't like, 
So I had to settle for much deficit. So that's what I did here. You can see the 1.3. And you can see here that it's the proton that is more massive when it comes to the mass deficit by 1.2. Write down this number, 1.2 MeV. And of course, the orange is electromagnetic. I'm not hand waving. I proved it by calculation. This is the neutron standard configuration. It's an equilateral triangle, no matter how it looks in the slide. It is an equilateral triangle. Uh, R is the, what's called the charge radius of the particle. And I, I, I went back to my high school physics, Yanni, and I started calculating Coulomb forces, the components in this event. And follow the repulsive components. Don't give a penny about attractive components. Why is that? Attractive components don't want to break up the particle. They don't want to like break it up in pieces. It's the repulsive components that want to do that. And the repulsive components, red, blue, blue, red, cancel out. This is the neutron. The neutron has a huge lifetime, 15 minutes as a free particle. It becomes totally stable when it joins protons inside the nucleus of atoms. The protons and the neutrons are stable inside nuclei. Outside, as free particles, the proton has never been seen to decay. The neutron decays in 15 minutes, which is 10 orders of magnitude. It leaves 10 orders of magnitude more than the pions, which come next. It lives a long time. If you calculate the potential energy of this system, Again, it's a highly idealized, highly symmetric system. You can repeat with an, I don't know, different triangle. More or less, you're going to find the same thing. Here, in this um, symmetric configuration, the potential energy of the system is zero. Now, from dynamics, if the potential energy is zero, the system is marginally stable for some people. And it's marginally unstable for other people. Uh, it um, sort of goes along with this uh, observed fact that a free neutron will decay to a proton uh, after 15, 20 minutes or something. Uh, oops, wait, it went back. Oh my goodness, oh, I'm pushing the wrong, wrong button. And this is a proton, my dear friend. Same diagram, same equilateral triangle, UUD configuration. Those UUDs now, they carry different charges, and the forces don't cancel, the repulsive forces don't cancel. In fact, you get those two big ones. These repulsive forces must be neutralized by the strong field. The strong field is what creates all this like mass energy situation with the quark gluon, C and all that. So the strong field has to pay up energy to neutralize those forces, otherwise the system is going to break instantly. How much does it have to pay? Anyone cares to guess? 1.2 MV. I did the pions too, I'm not going to show you the pions. This trick with the electromagnetic forces works only in the ground states. The, the nucleons, the proton and the, the other one, uh, are the ground state of baryons. The pions, little particles, are the ground state of mesons. And exactly the same thing there. The differences that we see in mass deficits can be explained by Coulomb forces. But you cannot play the same game with excited state, high energy states, because what happens is you take those little guys, which are happy in low energy systems, you provide a lot of energy to them, you excite them into higher energy states. Then anything goes, anything goes. The strong field cannot keep anything under control. Since you're coming in from the outside, you're providing so much more energy. I'm going to show you wave diagrams of barriers, excited barriers, low energy barriers, excited barriers, low energy vessels. Just to continue. Take a good look. When I saw this, I asked the obvious question. It's a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer, but I'll give you 10 seconds to contemplate. 
with yourselves. Looking at this diagram, what is the one and only immediate question that comes to mind and should be answered? Otherwise, you are not doing a complete investigation. This is a well, the white diagram has been known since Gelman's times. This means 1950s. It's Gelman who put them in the hexagon, the different particles. And as you can see here, strangeness, zero minus one minus two counts how many strange quarks you have, and how many quarks. And uh, uh, look at this diagram. The isospin third component runs horizontal. So it's like, Minus one, minus one half, zero, one half, one. And vertically, it's uh, the hypercharge. The hypercharge goes minus one, zero, one. And if you look at those diagonals or diagonal signs, whatever diagonals, you see the charge being the same. This is the electromagnetic charge. This is the diagram. Let me show you the excited states. They are arranged in a triangle but pretty much the same type of configuration, strangeness, running down horizontally. Uh, you got a, a hypercharge, uh, Y, and I3. And if you look at those uh, left-leaning sides and diagonals, you see the electromagnetic charge. Let me show you mesons of low energies. These are the pions and the colors. And the heat doesn't you know, go in the middle. And you see the same situation, more or less. Can I return here? What's the obvious question? When I saw this, I turned to my students and I said, I want to know what the right meaning signs in diagonal signs. If you don't tell me that this diagram is useless, it's incomplete. Well, it's not useless. Come on, it's incomplete. So they scratched their hands. They went away, they tried to figure out what the right meaning sides and diagonals mean. This is a famous formula, goes back to 1953. Nagano and another Japanese guy and gentleman formulated it. It relates the hypercharge Y, the I3 component of the isospin and the charge. You don't need to look at the way diagrams that uh, Gelman arranged stuff very nicely. You can look at this formula and again, the same question comes to mind. What's the question? What's gonna happen if I reverse the sign? This is Y over two plus I three. And they sell it to us for a quantum number, which is called the electromagnetic charge. Pretty serious quantum number. If you change the plus into a minus, you get a different quantum number. What is that number is the question. And it's the same number that you see here. I call it Q prime, right meaning diagonals, just run to the right, up. I call it Q prime and I call it the strong charge. First time I miss a strong charge, they told me, the strong force doesn't have any charge. I said, I know, but now it will, because I want it to have an equivalent charge. This is not an electromagnetic charge. And I, I, to this day, I don't know how they got this right. Of course, you get the Q prime if you reverse the plus into a minus, as I said, and if you combine the two equations, you get Q plus electromagnetic plus strong hypercharge. This is a new quantum number. It is not known. And my goodness, I still don't understand how they got the naming of the Y right without this formula. Because Y is the hypercharge, which is, of course, the summation and combination of two charges. How did they know to call it hypercharge as opposed to something else? There is the complete diagram in purple uh, labels. You see the Q prime running. And if you compare it to Q, there is no reflection across any vertical axis. There is a translation. Translation. Q minus one goes here. Q prime goes to Q minus one. Q one 
close to Q-prime one and stuff like that. It's a kind of complicated relation of this. Yeah, there is again the Qs. They're running all the way up to two here. And there is the message. And I'm very happy because I answered this question. I will still be trying now. I wouldn't be here with you. If I had an answer, I would still be trying to figure it out. Just a few more things, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy them. These are excited states. What you see here at the bottom, they have spin three halves. The famous deltas. They run from beta plus plus. Double charge all the way to beta minus. They're the lowest spin three half state in baryons. And if you move up 150 MeV, you go to the sigma stars. And then you go to the Xi, sorry, Xi, Xi, particle star. And then this type of diagram, well, the, the wave diagrams that Gelman created predicted the existence of omega minus at the top of the pyramid. I'm showing you this diagram for no other reason. Just to point out, of course, there is some sort of quantization going on here. 150 MeV, 150 MeV, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that if you look at the arrows backwards and run the arrows backwards, this gives you the decays of those particles when they break up. And I'm showing you this diagram to tell you that when the sigmas, any of the sigmas decays, it can easily go down to deltas and other stuff. Bios and all that. No problem. Before I had seen this diagram, I saw this one. And it blew me away. This is low energy baryonic states. The proton and the neutron, these are the nucleons. 250 go up to the sigmas, no star, and then the size. And there is the state here, lambda zero. 77 MeV below sigma zero. And the book, the good book is telling me that the sigma plus and the sigma minus will decay break up and produce protons and neutrons, both types, but not the sigma zero. The sigma zero will decay. A photon of 77 MeV will fly out and away and it will become lambda. And it's only the lambda then that will break up and give you nucleus, a nucleus or something. This diagram blew me away completely. Because the difference between sigma zero and lambda zero, you can see it here, is the isospin. Sigma zero, all the, all the sigmas have isospin one. That's a quantum. Lambda zero has zero. That's why it blew me away. It told me that when the isospin goes from one to zero, 77 MV are released back to the worship. And the decay chooses to emit a photon always. It also says that when you build the sigma zero from the lambda zero, the strong field is going to have to pay 77 MV to maintain the isospin. So, what did I have? I had the energy cost of turning a zero isospin to one. And of course, if you divide it by two, you have like from zero to one half and from one half to one. And I thought it's going to work and it didn't work. It didn't work because another thing came up that, sorry, that deflected me. Uh, Going from zero to one half is not the same as one half to zero. And this is not only limited to isospin. Take any conserved quantity or any quantum number, if you like, in atomic physics. Going from zero to one half and from one half to zero is not the same. You have to pay additional energy, not very much, but non zero, to get the state unstuck from zero. 
if the lambda zero has zero isospin, this means that lambda zero does not even know of the existence of isospin. It knows nothing about isospin. So you have to teach it that there is such a thing when you give it energy. And then once it knows that there is such a thing as isospin, you can launch it to go to one or to one half. When I did that, are my energy equations, simple additions, subtractions of energy components and quarks turning one to another quark and all that, allowed me to calculate all kinds of energy levels in barriers, mesons, all of them. And, and then I turned to quarks. After I was happy, I mean, this little guy here started everything. After I did like baryonic uh, transitions between quarks, I went to mesons. Mesons are very special because each meson has one quark and one anti-quark. So now, by playing the same game of transitions with energies and binding energies, and what does the, I could find all the transition energies of the quarks and the anti-quarks. Oh, I had found the quarks from barriers. But I could find the anti-quarks. And this is my last slide. And it is an indication of uh, CP violation. Uh, <coughs> quarks on the left, anti-quarks on the right. Ground state, ground state, an amazing reversal, amazing reversal of ground states. We all know that the U, we all know that the U is the true ground state. And uh, the D is a little bit higher, as we said. But to turn the U into a D, you have to pay 1.64. Here yeah, it's the other way around. To turn the U bar to the D bar, you get, you receive 1.64, and the V is released. But where things go really bad for CP violation and antimatter underrepresentation is of the third quark. I didn't do the heavy ones, I don't care. I, I have demonstrated uh, by addition and subtraction, solving linear systems of equations. That's what I did. Energy calculations. I proved that there is a CP violation. You need to pay 126 MV to turn a D into an S. You need to pay three or three times to turn a D bar into an S bar. Three times. That's very expensive, even for the strong field. Because of the discrepancy, there is no way that the strong force or anybody else for that matter in this universe would create equal amounts for those things. It will predominantly create regular quarks. That's the famous, that's the origin of a famous CP violation. So it was found, or maybe as I should say, I found, I traced the origin of CP violation, noting the energies of the particles or the conglomerates or this or that, or you know, the pieces that you get, the fragments out of the decay. I traced the origin to transition energies and binding energies. When the D turns to S, the strong force has to pay up. Okay, the transition happens, the D becomes S, it has to pay up into the pool. 126 MeV to hold the S, because if it doesn't pay it, the S will decay immediately back to D. Same thing here. But here it has to pay dearly. 308. So I think this is a solid demonstration. The arithmetic is easy. I haven't done any complicated calculations, nothing. So I think this is demonstration of CP violation and uh, uh, I'm waiting for the last hadron collider to justify what well, they're not going to, because they can measure transition energy. They can only measure energies in the fragments. So I have no hope that that will ever be justified by experiment. So my hopes are in arithmetic. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you for the Questions to the round here. It's an exact calculation, it's more than a prediction. 308 is so exact. Your other relations, do they predict the other particles that we haven't found? 
question. You said the masses of the particles are combinations of three numbers. You have PDFI, you have like three, three particles. No, three quarks. Stick their heads out of the quark fluency. Saying that 19 parameters of the model, oh. or like three parameters, you can explain the rest. Oh, to find other particles? Yes. It's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. I, I, I can empirically use geometric means to find some particles at the DV scale, but I don't think they would find them. I don't think they exist. Beyond the top quark, which is the most massive, I think there is nothing all the way to near the flight state. No. But it's a belief, I can't promise. Either way. But you can find geometric means and you can increase the light. I've already done. I calculated three in masses at the DV state. This is where the people are going anyway. I made three predictions, but I don't feel very well. Who wants to ask? Okay, whether the discussion may continue, we have to stop also because of the. Okay. Uh, okay. So, thank you again. And and meeting for all. And I need to convert. Yeah. And meeting.